of Political Scope. I'm Michael Young, filling in for Edward Lane. Today we're going to be discussing the PPP's 22nd anniversary um, in office. We're going to be discussing things with respect to development and as well the progress and growth in, of Guyana. With me to discuss these issues is the, the General Secretary of the People's Progressive Party, Civic, Mr. Clement Rui. Welcome to Political Scope, Mr. Rui. Thank you. First of all, this is a very um, auspicious occasion for the party and I'm pretty sure persons are celebrating the different accomplishments of the party. I want us to discuss the pre-history um, of the party, pre-office, pre-1992, if you can call it that. I want us to talk a little bit about the party's record in office over the 22nd, 22 years. And I want us to also discuss issues with respect to where the party wants to take Guyana in the future. First of all, help us to understand the history of the party in the pre-1992 era. The party, of course, the party was established in the 1st of January 1950. Yes. And the founder leaders of that party are, have, have all passed on, with the exception of one, who is Mr. Ashton Chase, who is still alive and participates in many activities of our party once he's available. Ever since the formation of the party, the struggles have been very intense. The most fundamental one at the beginning was the struggle for universal adult suffrage. Yes. That is, to uh, allow every single Guyanese, irrespective of race, class, uh, or wealth, to have the right to vote, what is called universal adult suffrage. And um, the, in those days, uh, it was only people, what is called a property class, people who had large amounts of property, land, uh, movable property, uh, money. These are the people who voted in the, in the colonial days. And the party uh, mounted a massive struggle in Guyana to push the colonial powers to grant universal adult suffrage to every single Guyanese. We succeeded in that. Uh, before that, however, there was a suspension of the Constitution in 1953, as a result of which uh, the party was forced to go underground and made uh, contact among the leaders extremely difficult. Then we had the split in the party in 1955, uh, a couple of years after the Constitution was suspended. This is where you had two PPPs, PPP Barnum and PPP Jagan. Okay. Mr. Barnum split the PVP because he wanted to be the leader of the party and he wanted to isolate the rest under Dr. Jagan. He didn't, however, succeed. Uh, he was hoping that the split of the party would be along racial lines. That, you know, there were a lot of Afro Guyanese in the party in those days because it was a nationalist party okay. fighting mainly for independence. And all who wanted to be involved in that fight could be a member of the party. Barnum was hoping that with the split, the majority of afro guyanese would follow him, but that did not happen. And so uh, Dr. Jagan was able to keep the party united, and then when they went to the polls in 1957, the party won the elections, and from 57 to 1990, from 57 to 1964, the party was in office. I should also, should, however, mention that there were elections held before that, somewhere around 1953. National uh, elections? National elections. And um, we were only in office for 133 days. And that's when the constitution was suspended because there were some who felt that the party was orienting itself on this communist uh, ideology. And in those days with the Cold War at its height, the British colonial uh, people didn't want to have such a situation existing. So they suspended the Constitution in 1953, 
the party was only able to be in office for 133 days. And then after the situation normalized, after a commission of inquiry was established by the British, elections were again held in 1957, and the party won the elections and from 57 to 64. For seven years, we were in government. Now, during that seven years, a lot of uh, transformations took place in Guyana. And by the way, let me say that this word transformative economic development that we're talking about today is not something new. Ever since the party took office, for example, when we won the first elections in 53, just for 133 days, the educational reforms that were carried out by the party were massive and significant because we were able to remove the control of the schools from many of the churches and bring it to make it public education. And then there are a number of other reforms that were taken in that short period of time to modernize the country, even within a colonial context. And then for the seven year period, after we got in the government back in 57, the transformations continue in the agricultural sector. That's when a tremendous amount of lands were opened up. That's where Black Bush Polar, Brand Maxari, the Canals Polar, all of those schemes to open up agricultural lands uh, and to make drainage and irrigation much more effective and efficient uh, was initiated. The University of Guyana was initiated during that period too. The Bank of Guyana was set up during that period. Uh, transportation with the massive ferries, the Macoria, the Malali, and um, the, uh, I don't recall the other one's name, but three big ferries were built. Sorry. And uh, to improve the transportation situation in the riverine areas and so on. And uh, so there was a lot of transformation that took place in that. 57 to 64 period. Uh, and that is the period when Guyana was known as the breadbasket of the Caribbean because agriculture began to flourish so significantly and so massively that we were able to export many agricultural products to the Caribbean and the rest of the world. And that's where sugar, rice, uh, catch crops, and so on began to earn significant amounts of foreign exchange. Well, not many people were pleased with the fact that the PVP was remaining in office for seven years. Independent stocks were going on. At the same time. At the same time. Yes. And there was a lot of discussion on the question of independence. Trinidad and Tobago, Jamaica, Barbados, they already had their independence. And Guyana was the last of the large, what you call the MDCs, the medium developed countries to have its independence in 1966. But there was a conspiracy between the local politicians who were opposed to the PVP, the British and the Americans, to keep the PVP out from office. Because the whole idea was that the Guyana must not achieve independence with the PVP in office. Because that would have been a significant, number one, blow to the opposition, and uh, as a victory for the PPP. So the whole idea was to not to allow the PPP to be in government when Guyana got its independence in 1966. And so what they did was to change the electoral system from first party post to proportional representation. And even though the PPP won the majority of votes, the British governor invited in the leader of the United Force, Mr. Peter de Gare, and who set up Banks DIH, yes. and uh, Mr. Barnum, who was the leader of the PNC, to form a coalition and to uh, establish a government, a coalition government. And that's how the PVP was uh, maneuvered out of office. So we were in the opposition from 1964 to 1992. Quite a long period of time. Quite a long, and we went through tremendous difficulties during that time. In fact, Many people used to tell us, you know, why don't you shut up the party? The party can't ever win government again in Guyana. They were even saying that Dr. Jagan should get out of politics and go back to dentistry, because you know he was a professional dentist. Yes. And um, 
In fact, what we, we kept on, there was also an extremist view developing in the country, particularly among some of our supporters and some uh, people outside of the party who were saying that, look, since we can't get power through the ballot box because all the elections were rigged, since we can't get political power through the ballot box, and since nothing is moving to get the PNC out of office, we should take up arms and fight to get the PNC out of office. How did the party feel about that view and that sort of thinking, given the fact that it would have already been in opposition for a very long time? Well, that is what was frustrating a lot of people, because you see, a lot of struggles were going on. We were fighting against rigged elections, and there were so many battles that were being fought, and we weren't uh, making any headway in terms of getting into office. And this is what was contributing to the frustration. And as a result of that frustration, extremist views began to develop. So what the party did, the party held countrywide consultations throughout the country, particularly among its membership, to hear from them what they felt about going in that direction. Armed struggle as against the part that was led by Martin Luther King and Mahatma Gandhi, which was massive passive resistance, non-cooperation. And most of the membership of the party supported the view that we should go for passive resistance and non-cooperation. Uh, that proved to be very successful because it called for a lot of political work on the ground. Many of our supporters felt that if we were to go the direction of armed struggle, it would be a bloodbath. A lot of people would have been killed unnecessarily. Mm -hmm. It is quite possible the party would have been forced underground again, as in the early days, and it would have set back the struggle. So Dr. Jagan and many of the leaders of the party in those days decided that that is not the direction to go. And as it turned out, with patient work, consistent work, struggle, sacrifice, many of our comrades going to prison, many of our comrades being beaten up by the police in those days by participating in picketing exercises. You know, today you could participate in any kind of demonstration also. And um, we eventually, in 1992, uh, managed to win the struggle for free and fair elections. But it wasn't easy because uh, we had to lobby in Washington. We went to Capitol Hill and lobbied many of the congressmen and the senators, both from the Republicans and the Democratic side. Uh, tremendous amount of work was done among NGOs in the United States. And uh, we also hired a lobbying firm to assist us because remember, we couldn't be in Washington all the time, although uh, we, did, we weren't in government, so we didn't control the embassy. Yes. So we had to hire a lobbying firm uh, by name of, uh, headed by name, by, uh, a man by name of Mr. Reichler. Mm -hmm. And they were the ones that were constantly walking the corridors on Capitol Hill, talking to, Ameri talking to the U.S. congressmen and senators, even getting to the vice president and the president of the United <coughs> States. And I recall one night at a diplomatic function at the U.S. Embassy, I think it was on the occasion of the uh, Independence Day of the U.S., the, amb the then ambassador read a message from his president in where he said, the message said, was calling for free and fair elections in Guyana and was more or less saying that if free and fair elections are not held in Guyana sooner rather than later, Ghana could face sanctions. And that was the first salvo that was fired uh, in the direction that by that time Mr. Barnum had died in 1985 and Mr. Hoyt was the president. Mr. Hoyt came under tremendous pressure, both from the CARICOM leaders, the Commonwealth leaders, <coughs> and people from all over the world. Because I think uh, the work had, of our work had become so effective internationally that everyone knew that Guyana was a dictatorship mm. and that we needed free and fair elections to restore democracy in Guyana. And as a result of that struggle, by that time, 
We were organizing massive protests and demonstrations in Guyana. There were thousands of people coming out all over the country. We had created what is called the Patriotic Coalition for Democracy, in which the, all the forces opposed to the PNC were united. Uh, we, had the, uh, we had a number of NGOs that had been established mm -hmm. to fight for democracy. That was the period also when Walter Rodney was killed, during that period. Yes because this was the first black leader that had emerged, that had taken to the streets with protest actions against the PNC. And obviously, Mr. Barnum could not entertain, so to speak, a prominent black left and progressive leader opposing him. And so they had to get rid of him. And that's the inquiry that is now going on, as you know, the Commission of Inquiry, with respect to the circumstances under which Walter, all of Walter Rodney was killed. So, Michael, this was an extremely difficult period. It was also an exciting period, but it was fraught with a lot of dangers. People feared for their lives. Many people left the country. Many people kept out of politics. People did not want to come out and struggle for free and fair elections. Many people were driven into fear and so forth. And it was in that kind of situation, both the external mm -hmm. with the pressures, and he had the Carter Center also coming into the picture in those days. So it was the external factor and the domestic factor that combined to exert pressure on Mr. Hoyt to carry out certain electoral reforms in the country. One of the electoral reforms was counting the votes at the place of poll. We never had that in Guyana. They never counted the votes at the place of poll. And that was one of the concessions he was forced to give. He first said that if the votes were to be counted at the place of poll, it would create a logistical nightmare. And he rejected that. But after the pressure came, not only from the Carter Center, but from the people marching in Guyana and from other forces outside, he had to concede. The other reform was to allow observers, foreign observers, to observe the election. We never had that before in Guyana. And so this country was flooded with foreign observers when the elections were held in 1992, and they kept a very watching, watchful eye on what was going on in the polling stations. And then we had the change of the Elections Commission, which is now called GCOM. In those days, it was the Elections Commission, it was called that. I was a member in those days. You had just three pe two people. You had, sorry, two, three. You had myself representing the PPP. You had, and two persons from the PNC. They had the majority, and you had the chairman, who was Mr. Ballers, a judge. And I can tell you, in those days, it was almost impossible to get that commission to do anything to satisfy the electorate. All they would, be keep, all they would keep telling me is that we must go to the parliament to change the laws. So a third concession that was made by Mr. Hoyt, after tremendous pressure was exerted, was to reconstitute GCOM, and that's how GCOM is today. The chairman had to be elected as a result of submission of a name that was acceptable to all the parties. You have to give the president a name which he found acceptable. As well. You see? So Rudy Collins, who is now working at Foreign Affairs, he became the first chairman of a reform, GCOP. And he did a fantastic job. Of course, he came under a lot of pressure, you know, uh, at that time, but he stood strong. And if you look at the photograph, you would see that he was the chairman that was swearing Dr. Jagan at the state house function in October 1992. Now, obviously, after this, after this entire troubling period, the party got into office. It must have been a watershed moment, not only for democracy, but for the party and all of the years it would have spent in opposition. Mm -hmm. I want to know, what was the paradigm shift when you got into office? Was it difficult to transition between the work you were doing as an opposition political party into putting all of the things you had advocated over that 28-year period into policies that would then make sense, satisfying, obviously, those 
those who would have been lobbying for you over the 28 years and those persons who were opposed to the PPP still? Well, the transition, I think, was a little, had some turbulences because obviously many in the PNC didn't want to accept the change. But it eventually became what is called uh, a fait accompli for the opposition, then the, the, the PNC, which had now become the opposition. Uh, we set up a transition team. Dr. Lunchen was the head of our team to make the transition. And he did an extremely fantastic job of transitioning the PPP from PPPC from opposition to government. I think that will go down in the history books of the role he played at that particular period. And then he became the head of the presidential secretariat and he's remained there since then. So uh, what, was, what was of an advantage to us was the fact that Dr. Jagan had been the premier you see, of the country for seven years. So he had governmental experience. Uh, many of us did not have the experience of running a ministry. Uh, there were a lot of comrades also who had served in parliament for those 28 years, so they had a lot of parliamentary experience. And they understood, to some extent, what government business was all about. Because being in parliament, you get acquainted, if you are sharp enough, with how government conducts its business. You see? So we were fortunate enough to have a, a number of parliamentarians who had been in parliament for a number of years, and when they transitioned from opposition parliamentarians to government MPs and ministers, they, uh, as they landed, so they took off. And then, as I said, we had Dr. Jagger, who was the premier. He was the head of the cabinet, and he was able to you know, situate us in such a way to make sure that we did things well. Now, there were, the main thing was the economy. The main challenge was the economy because the infrastructure was run down, the social and physical infrastructure was run down. Schools were in disrepair, hospitals were in disrepair, uh, health centers were in a total mess. The transportation situation was terrible. Uh, everything was almost broken down. The reason why that had happened because the government at that time, the PNC government, ran into serious economic problem with the foreign debt issues, uh, shortage of foreign exchange, shortage of skills. People had immigrated the country in large numbers, and there was no confidence, no hope. So people weren't producing. But some believe that at that time the PNC was managing the economy um, well. When you look at the PNC's international image, when you look at their foreign portfolio, and some of the positions they took on very important international issues, yeah, was well, it the same at home? The some who would be thinking that would be some who supported the government to the day. But everyone knew. There was a McIntyre report that was written about the nature of Guyana's economy between the 1992 to 1994 period, what we inherited. What we inherited was a total mess. And it's not, this is not only propaganda. If you read the McIntyre report, if you read the World Bank report, the IDB report, the CDB report, the IMF report, yes. because remember, we were in the clutches of the IMF in those days. You know, we still had a, a serious structural adjustment program with the IMF. So what Dr. Jagan and his team did was to reorient the economy. I remember one of the first steps he took. He said, we're not going to pay any contributions to international organizations. Now, you know, as a member of the United Nations, the OAS, the Commonwealth at CARICOM, you have to pay what is called contributions because you benefit from these organizations. Yes. And as intergovernmental organizations, you have to make financial contributions to them. He cut that out. He suspended it for a number of years because he felt that he could take this foreign exchange that we were, which were large sums of money and use it more effectively in the social sector. His main focus was health and education. His principal focus was to, re, was to readjust the budget and to spend more of the budgetary allocated resources on health and education. Under the previous administration, the foreign affairs received the bulk of the money. And that was because they wanted a good 
image abroad. You see? To cover up all the nonsense that was taking place That's in right. Guyana. Mm -hmm. So they were spending huge sums of monies in the embassies abroad. They gave a good picture of what was happening in Guyana. When we got into the government, we rearranged the priorities. So all the, not such large amounts of money was going to foreign affairs any longer. Monies were now shifted to health, education, human services, other social services to the people, and also to the security sector as well. Mm -hmm. This was the time when the police and the joint services began to see an increase in resources being allocated them because they were also very badly treated, notwithstanding what Mr. Granger is talking today, mm -hmm. as though he's the czar or the guru of security. One should ask him what was the kind of money that was made available to the police, the fire service, the prison service, and the army in those days. Very Let, small amounts of money. Let's fast track to 1997. Yeah. By that time, government would have had five years in office. There would have been um, lots of talk about progress taking place. There would have been physical changes mm -hmm. given the policy position of the PPP and its government at that point in time. 1997 presented more challenges um, electorally when we talk about um, elections. And let's talk as well about 1999 because the, the entire period between 97 and 99 was perhaps the most challenging period for the PPP as a government and as a party that was occupying the executive arm. Well, by 90, remember 97, Dr. Jagan had already died. Yes. So we went to elections without Dr. Jagan. Yes. Mistress Jagan was now the presidential candidate. She took over the mantle of leadership. And um, but the economy had already begun to turn around slowly. We already began to see signs of recovery. But these signs were very, very uh, weak. As yet, they weren't powerful, mm -hmm. but at least the steps were being taken to reorient the economy in the direction along the model that we wanted it to be. We wanted a, an economy and a budget to be modeled where the social sector would have gotten the majority of funds, thus helping the people to give them a better access to health, public health, public Those education, resources. and so on. So we were making baby steps at that time. Because remember, you have to bear in mind what we had inherited. Yes. So there was no magic one. There was no, there couldn't be any fast knock knock action. Everything had to be done slowly, but at least we knew where we wanted to go. So uh, by 97, when we went to the elections with Mrs. Jagan as the presidential candidate, she won. But that was an extremely challenging period too, because the opposition took to the streets. And you remember they said they didn't want any white American Jew to be the president of this country. That was the kind of racial propaganda that was coming out from the PNC in those days. And that's the period when they lit fires outside offices of the president gates, uh, giving the impression that, they, that they, uh, what they're, doing, they're doing something in relation to Obia and black magic and this, all these things they were doing. Mm -hmm. So there was a tremendous amount of pressure, and then there was even a strike that was called by the public service to exert greater pressure on the China Jagan administration. What was even more difficult was the decision that was taken to reduce Mrs. Jagan's tenure from five years to three years. See, they cut our term of office from five to three years. And so she only served three years as the president of this country. A woman that contributed so much to the upliftment of women in this country. There's no other woman, and I can say this without fear of contradiction, there is no other woman, in my humble opinion, that started out in the colonial era to the modern Guyana that made such a tremendous contribution to the upliftment of all, not only supporters of the PPP, all women in this country. She helped to organize the women who were working as domestics. She helped to organize the women who were working in restaurants. She helped to organize women from all over the country. Of course, she didn't do it alone. She did it with a team. But I'm saying that notwithstanding the fact 
that she did all these things for women in Guyana, and she was rightfully entitled to be elected the head of state of this country. The racial propaganda against her was of such that it made a toll on her health. And then the negotiators came, and one of the conditions that they put was that the PVP term of office should be reduced from three years instead of five years. And then we had to go to elections uh, once again. That's another, that's another important period in the history of the party. We're talking about Sam Hines taking over as president that's subsequently. Correct. We're talking about the introduction of Barack Jagju, who was finance minister at that time, to the position of head of state, a very young man at that time, a very young executive of the party, someone who ha was very grounded too in politics by that time. But he was one, one candidate that people did not expect. Yeah. What was the rationale behind that? Well, after Mrs. Jagan uh, stepped down, Sam took over, Commissioner yes. Sam took over, and he continued for the next two years as the president of the country. And then we went to the election now with what is called the 18. Uh, Barrett then became the president of the country, and he did a fantastic job. He was the youngest president. Well, in fact, he took over. He had to serve out some of the period. Yes. that Mrs. Jagan could not complete. Yes. And so Bard became the president. And then he served out that period, and then he went now to the elections, and he won on his own strength and his own popularity. Bard was a fantastic president. He has a mind of his own. He has a clear vision of where he wants to take Guyana. Many of the transformative projects started with him, and some of them are still continuing no, forget the propaganda of the Stabuk news and the Kaicho news and the opposition that Donald Ramatar is in the shadow of Barra Jack Dio. The fact of the matter is that these projects started during the Jack Dio administration. And these are massive projects. These are flagship projects. Jack Dio could not complete them during his period because of the fact that they're so massive, they require so much lengthy negotiations so they could not be completed, for example, the airport project, the Amila Falls project, and so on. He initiated those things. But elections were held, and then they, flo they flowed over to the Ramatar administration. But Jagdio was chosen among us because, you know, uh, while we were all peers, so to speak, we always have what is called a primus inter pares, the force among equals. And so we looked around and we said that here was a young, bright comrade uh, who studied in Moscow. He's an economist. He understands the economy. Uh, he worked at the State Planning Secretariat. He'd been having some very fruitful and productive discussions with Dr. Jagan before he passed away. And he had a fairly good feel for the economic situation in Guyana. And he also had a fairly good understanding of the vision of the party. Yes. And so he was chosen uh, to continue to, to live out, so to speak, the remaining of the years for the PVP uh, in office. Then we went to elections, and he won the elections, mm -hmm. and he continued from there on. But The 2000s, that may have been perhaps the quietest period within our country where there was stability and growth under Mr. Jagdio, and that was the period in our country where people believed that there was more, Guyana was more cohesive, there was more unity, and the people for the first time got along regardless of the election's results. Mm -hmm. Regardless of which party won, it was about being Guyanese and it was about being patriotic and about benefiting. What was the party's modus operandi while, while Mr. Jagdio was in power? Well, Jack didn't have it easy all the time, you know. He also came under pressure at different times. Yes. Uh, but he was very skillful. His style of running the presidency, because every president comes with his own style. Dr. Yes. Jagan has his own style. Mrs. Jagan had her own style. Sam Hein has his own style. He had his own style, too. But he was a very skillful negotiator. And he knew how to... Uh, maneuver, and he knew how to do what I would call tactical and strategic positioning 
of the state and the government, uh, and the party gave him full support with whatever he was doing. And that is why I believe that we were able to achieve such tremendous growth rates under his presidency as well. Many believe that there was a disconnect between what Mr. Jagdu was doing as president in his later terms, in the last two terms, and the party's ideology and what the party stood for and the party's own vision, its own manifesto. What is your position? That's not true. That's totally untrue. Jagdu has always been in the leadership of the party. He's never expressed any dissenting voice about the ideology of the party, privately or publicly. There will always be debates about the relevance in a, this context compared to the previous context. We always have to keep re-examining, you know, what we stand for, our program, our policies, and so on. And he has a very alert mind. And, um, you know, there are others who would have views as well. So we always have these debates and polemics inside the party. And that, I believe, is the reason why the party has been able to maintain its relevance. Because the fact of the matter is we're able to debate internally, engage in polemics, not cuss outs, and engage in healthy discussion in order to ensure that the party finds its rightful place in the society. The key thing is that the party must always maintain its connection with the people. And to maintain that connection with the people, you have to be doing things for the people. You see, you have to be providing goods and services to the people. And we have to also have a feel for what the needs of the people are. And that requires us to go on the ground as well, you see? So in doing that kind of work, Jack Dio was a, was a principal figure in all of this. We had a lot of what is called cabinet outreaches. Yes. You know, we went all over the country, spent weekends and so walking the ground and things like that. And so um, I think that that helped to a large extent to ensure that the party and the government were at one, and that there was no differences in the direction which the party is going or the direction which the government is going. Because that was really the ruling party. The government is, 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 is adopting programs and policies based on our manifesto, which is announced after the election. So by 2011, um, would you say that Guyana was in, the, in its prime? Development had had been married with growth. Development had been married with the PPP too as a political party guiding that process. And the country was poised then to take off and to realize its full potential, p potential by 2011. Yes, the trajectory, the trajectory which Guyana was on by 2011 when we embarked upon a new process, electoral process, was clearly... Uh, it was, was very clear. And um, the, the economy was in a very healthy situation. Standard of living was slowly increasing. The livelihoods of people was improving. We're seeing more cars on the streets. People are, you know, have more disposable incomes. People are able to travel more often. And the economy was, I wouldn't say booming, but the economy, I mean, compared to, let's say, China and so on, but the economy was picking up and had embarked on a trajectory for which there was no return because the construction industry was moving, the housing industry was moving, the services sector had picked up, yes. the private sector was expanding, there was more foreign direct investment, there was more uh, investment public-private partnerships, there was also more investment on the private sector side, on the domestic level, you see? So things were moved, the, the country was on a and the country was on a, a takeoff point. Well, that takeoff was met with some very, I don't know if you want to say disappointing election results. Yeah. The PPP lost its majority in the National Assembly, but it retained its um, power within the executive, or authority rather, within the executive. And now the party is going through another period of challenges. This 2000, I'm referring to the 2011 to 2014 period that we're in, where the parliament is now marred by gridlock, and it seems as though everyone is tense about the politics of the country and the situation here. What is the party's perspective on these matters? Well, after the 2011 elections, we spent months doing some introspection to understand what really went wrong. We, did, we held countrywide consultations with our membership. 
We brought our leading activists, organizers, a whole host of people together, and we discussed and exchanged views in a very critical manner, very objective discussion about sober discussion, what really took place and what was it that really made us lose our majority in the parliament because no one could ever believe that we could that that could ever happen what had happened yes and it was obviously a wake-up call for the party and so the introspection that was done led us to believe that there was some disconnect between the masses of people and the party and as a result of that conclusion we obviously had to do what is called some rectification. We had to rectify whatever those errors, miscalculations were. And since that time, we have been engaging in that kind of exercise. Until Reconnecting, mm -hmm. rectifying. I think we've accomplished significantly uh, we, we, since then, because, uh, I mean, if you're in politics, you can know when you're going wrong or when you're going right. And right now, as we speak, we're holding a number of activities to mark the 22nd anniversary of the party in government, and the turnout of these activities are massive. We had one, for example, only last night at Red House, and there was such a tremendous overflow. You know, a lot of people were outside that couldn't fit in the hall. And I was very impressed last night. We had once also a teen on the quarantine. I understand the school was jammed the capacity. So there's a kind of energy, and this is not energy as a result of Red Bull and energy drink. <laughs> this is the real McCoy. <laughs> this is energy that is coming from people who have recognized that mistakes were made. We've corrected those mistakes, or we're correcting them. It's a work in progress, and we are girding our lines in preparations for any eventuality, whether local government elections, whether general elections, whether no confidence vote. I think our membership is now motivated. They're now energized. They're now alert. Now, it doesn't mean to say that we must rest on our laurels. We have to continue working all the time on the ground. Political work requires the leaders to be constantly in touch with its supporters, keeping them mobilized, keeping them on the alert, educating them because they must know, yes. for example, what the no confidence vote is all about. They must know what local government elections is all about, the, you know, the pros and the cons. Well, they have a general knowledge already about general elections, but we still have to do the political work connected to general elections. We have to tell them about the uh, anti-money laundering and counting the financial and terrorism bill. Every single important issue in this country. We got to talk to them about budget issues, you know, the nature of the cuts that took place, why the PNC is behaving the way they're behaving in the National Assembly, what are likely to be the implications, were they to win the government, them having demonstrated what they would do, even with a one seat majority in the parliament. And so there's a lot of political education going on. Uh, through our education committees in the various regions, educating our supporters, educating our members in particular, the women, the youth, about the perspectives for the future, mm -hmm. and preparing them so that come an elections, whether in the the fifty odd municipalities, the fifty odd NDCs, and the six municipalities, or general and regional elections, that we have to be. We have to come different now. It's no business as usual. We're going in fighting, and we're going in for victory. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Rui, for joining us on today's edition of Political Scope. Finally, I want to ask, what would be the PPP's message to the Guyanese public as it celebrates its 22nd anniversary? What do you think um, the party wants to say at this point in time, in brief? The party would want to say to the viewing public, that we remain committed to providing the goods and services as a ruling party to the ordinary man and woman, to every single guy, irrespective of race, class, or creed. We are committed to ensuring that 
Guyana remains a country that is well respected in the international community, in CARICOM, and that every single Guyanese must be able to hold their head high inside Guyana or outside Guyana. But this can only come about if we all put our shoulders to the wheel, like other more industrialized countries have done, to ensure that the country grows, the economy grows, that the cake gets bigger, and we're able to give more parts of that cake to the wider society so that every single Guyanese can benefit from the production and productivity that is taking place in the country in order for individuals to prosper, communities to prosper, and for the country to prosper as well. Thank this you. is the commitment of the PPP. Thank you again, Mr. Rui. And thank you very much, viewers, for joining us on Political Scope. I'm Michael Young. Do have a very good night. Goodbye.